I see folks are coming in. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started uh, while the room fills. Good afternoon. I'm Ivan Henderson, Vice President of Programming at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. And we'd like to welcome you to our final day of programs for our MLK weekend celebration sponsored by citizens. Be sure to visit us at www.aampmuseum.org to learn more about our full schedule of events beyond today, including a packed schedule of Black History Month pro programs for all ages, um, as well as virtual opportunities for learning and interaction uh, for people in Philadelphia and far beyond. This year, we're delighted to present Black Art and Visions of Freedom, a special keynote by Marking Time author, Dr. Nicole R. Fleetwood. Dr. Fleetwood will discuss the centrality of African-American visual artists and collectives to Black freedom struggles throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. Dr. Fleetwood's presentation will be followed by a dialogue with Mary Baxter, one of the artists whose work is featured in the Museum's Rendering Justice exhibition, along with the Q&A with attendees. And I have to encourage you all to virtually tour Rendering Justice by visiting www.aampmuseum.org. This exhibition produced in partnership with Mural Arts and guest curated by Jesse Crimes features the work of nine formerly incarcerated or justice impacted artists and offers an unflinching look at the American criminal justice system. Through this work, we have interacted with Dr. Fleetwood and a number of the artists. Uh, they've interacted with our staff, our docents and our audiences multiple times with today's perhaps being one of their most important interactions and visits with AMP. Now we'll pause briefly for a message from Dan Fitzpatrick of Citizens, followed uh, by an introduction of our, of our lecturer for the day. So we thank you for being here with us and celebrating the legacy of Dr. King, and thank you for supporting the African American Museum in Philadelphia. Hello, my name is Dan Fitzpatrick, President of Citizens here in the Mid-Atlantic region. Citizens and the Citizens Charitable Foundation have been proud partners of the African American Museum in Philadelphia for the past 15 years. This year, our support of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Weekend helps to make the museum's online programming free and open to the public. Every year I look forward to celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. King with the museum. While this year we can't be together in person, we need to remember Dr. King's message now more than ever. The events of 2020 have forced all of us to reflect on where we are as a country and the systematic changes that need to occur. At Citizens, we're privileged to play an important role in our customers' lives, in the health of our economy, and in creating a country where everyone has the opportunity to achieve the American dream and experience it each day without prejudice, racism, or fear. We all have a responsibility to correct the mistakes of our past and pursue a society where everyone has the opportunity to reach their potential. Every January, we celebrate Dr. King's life and legacy, but we need to live his message every day. He preached and peacefully fought for equity and justice and freedom for all. And we still need to advocate for these virtues. Join me in the African American Museum in Philadelphia this weekend in listening, learning, and reflecting on Dr. King's dream for equality. The museum offers many opportunities to do just this and pay tribute to Dr. King's life and legacy. In closing, thank you to the museum staff for putting together terrific programs this year and every year. You help us remember Dr. King and live his mission, mission of equality for all. So please enjoy this year's events and please stay safe. Thanks so much. Hello everyone. My name is Hannah Wallace and I'm the Educational Programming Manager for the African American Museum in Philadelphia. Uh, so today I have the, the pleasure of introducing our two speakers. Dr. Nicole R. Fleetwood is a writer, curator, and professor of American studies and art history at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She's the author of Marking Time, Art and the Age of Mass Incarceration, and the curator of the exhibition of the same name, currently on view at MoMA PS1 through April 4th, 2021. Her other books are on racial icons, blackness and the public imagination, and troubling vision, performance, visuality, and blackness. 
excuse me. She is also co-editor of Aperture Magazine's Prison Nation issue, focusing on photography's role in the documenting of mass incarceration and co-curator of Aperture's touring exhibition of the same name. Fleetwood has co-curated exhibitions and programs on art and mass incarceration at the Andrew Friedman Home, Aperture Foundation, Cleveland Public Library, Eastern State Penitentiary, MoMA PS1, Mural Arts Philadelphia, and the Zimmerelli Art Museum, and the Urban Justice Center. Her work has been supported by the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center, the NYPL's Coleman Center for the Scholars and Writers, ACLS, Whiting Foundation, Dennis, excuse me, Deniston Hill Residency, Schomburg Center for Scholars and Residents, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the NEH. So later in the conversation, uh, Dr. Fleetwood will be uh, meeting with Mary Enoch Elizabeth Baxter, also known by her hip hop name, Isis the Savior. She's an award-winning award Philadelphia-based artist who creates socially conscious music through an autobiographical lens. Although it has been a decade since her release from a Philadelphia prison, Mary's time spent on the inside continues to shape the direction of her music and film work. Her entertaining but poignant works offer a critical perspective on the particular challenges for women of color when they become immersed in the criminal justice system. Ms. Baxter is also a 2018 and 2019 Mural Arts, Re, excuse me, Mural Arts Philadelphia Reimagining Reentry Fellow and a 2019 Leeway Foundation Transformation Awardee. So it's such a pleasure uh, to be with you today. I'm gonna pass the mic over to Nicole R. Fleetwood. Thank you, Dr. Nicole R. Fleetwood. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm hoping everyone's having a peaceful Martin Luther King Day. Um, and I really love the theme that the museum has chosen this year. It, it's an it's a invitation to be creative and generous in thinking about how we serve others. Um, and our, you know, for me, it's an, an empowering theme because I think, especially during this time of a pandemic and, um, you know, hyper aggressive um, anti black um, violence, uh, white nativism, you know, all over the news that it's easy to feel disempowered um, and feel despair. Um, and I think that, you know, the lesson here in King, the lesson that we can turn to every Martin Luther King Day is how vital we are to any freedom movement. Every single one of us is vital to a movement, um, the cause of freedom. Um, and I want to also bring up another one of my um, freedom fighting um, she sheroes, and that's um, Angela Davis, who says freedom is a constant struggle. Um, and, you know, there's not a moment where we're going to get to glory and just be able to sit on our laurels. We have to constantly be vigilant about creating the world that we all want to live in. I'm also really honored to be in conversation with Mary Backstory, who's taught me so much. She's an artist featured in Marking Time. Um, she's a brilliant visionary um, who also has taught me so much about um, believing in one's own creativity and um, envisioning the life that one wants to lead, lead no matter what circumstances one finds themselves in. So I'm really I'm happy that she's gonna be joining me. Um, I'll talk for about 25 to 30 minutes and then Mary will take over to talk more about the Rendering Justice um, exhibition. And, you know, I was, uh, as I was preparing for this um, event, I was looking at, I wanted a picture of King in community. And um, I, you know, I, I think we're, all, we're used to um, certain images of him um, like the March on Washington, but I really wanted to have him a community. And I love that, um, how intergenerational this image is, because for me, it is um, very much reflective of what we often quote him as envisioning, and that's the beloved community. And for me, that idea of the beloved community um, is not, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a radical practice of love, and it's loving beyond um, our comfort zones. Um, and it's also recommitting to um, a radical type of equality and justice that, that also centers 
um, anti-poverty campaigns um, at, the, at, at its very core. And it's something we especially need in this given moment, um, this moment given how many millions of black and brown people have been deeply impacted by the pandemic and have fallen into deeper levels of poverty and um, what Ruthie Wilson Gilmore says, um, premature death. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend some time just giving you some context for um, marking time art in the age of mass incarceration. And that's, that's my book, the book and exhibition um, that Hannah mentioned. Um, but what I wanna do is I wanna, I wanna go uh, back um, further over 150 years um, earlier to think about Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist and um, speaker who um, at the beginning of photography, right at, at, during its advent, he saw um, images as serving this really important role in black freedom struggles. He saw visual representation as so important to changing um, how black people enslaved and free people saw themselves, envisioned themselves uh, and how they were um, envisioned by a larger dominant public. He, uh, he um, is known to have sat many times for his own, uh, for his portrait. And um, in fact, was one of the most photographed um, people in the 19th century. Um, and his, you know, these deliberate portraits are really um, important for us in terms of thinking about um, the long history of uh, self-representation and portraiture um, in black art traditions. Um, along that line, I also want to bring up Sojourner Truth, um, this um, car, uh, image that uh, we know we have seen very often of Sojourner Truth, and it was part of a card um, that she would use often when she would travel and give talks, um, again, a, a, an incredible abolitionist um, and feminist. Um, who's also someone who's really important to Mary. Mary will talk uh, later about Sojourner Truth. Um, role in her life and also her, her, um, her art, um, but would use this image, this self-portrait, um, you know, to um, promote freedom causes would actually sell this. I sell the shadow to support the substance. Um, and this is in 1864. So I wanna just show you a few more, I think really important iconic um, images of um, early, um, of our earlier um, eras of black freedom struggles um, and one being a really important sign image that we've seen um, often that has actually um, in many ways gained um, kind of more visual traction in the past few years, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, making connections between um, contemporary anti-black violence, police violence and a long history of um, violence against black people. And so this is a sign that the NAACP would hang. Um, and it was part of the radical work of Ida B. Wells and other journalists and black activists um, of the early 20th century to bring attention to, to lynching. And, and this sign was not um, just about um, kind of visually cueing a larger public, but this sign was also about creating um, change, creating legal change, creating um, a change in terms of how black life was perceived um, and also really um, about coming together collectively across um, the various regions of the US because as we know, many of the lynchings were taking place in the South and this is a sign that was hanging in New York but also thinking more expansively about a black public um, and a black public that would mobilize throughout the uh, civil rights movement, um, especially under the leadership of Martin Luther King. And with that in mind, I wanna um, show you um, another really important um, sign um, that is connected to black freedom struggles and also uh, very much um, to the legacy of Martin Luther King. It is um, the I am a, my, a man iconic um, poster that was used by um, the striking sanitation workers in Memphis. And many of you who are familiar with um, civil rights history also know that um, it was um, in support of the striking sanitation workers that led Martin Luther King to Memphis 
um, where he was assassinated. Um, so this for me is, you know, is symbolic and important in, in so many ways in terms of um, thinking about the life of Martin Luther King, but also thinking about anti-poverty movements, um, visuality and race and ongoing freedom struggles. I want to show you a few images now um, of uh, movements, Black freedom struggle movements that are connected specifically to the work I do around mass incarceration, um, racial profiling, punitive policing, and the like. And um, you know, many people when they think of mass incarceration, they think of um, the contemporary era. Um, but artists like Faith Ringo, who is a part of um, the Black Emergency Cultural Co uh, Coalition, and they created um, incredible art exchanges between um, artists in New York, especially, and imprisoned Black artists and, and, and thinkers, created this really powerful um, piece, a piece of art in uh, between 1971 and 1972. And it was very much in um, solidarity with the protesters, imprisoned protesters in Attica. But it was also a, a really important sweeping gesture of thinking about the long history of settler colonialism um, and the various um, ways in which black indigenous people and brown people have been um, massacred, um, imprisoned um, and incapacitated by um, white settler nations, uh, nation building. And then another one of my favorite works is uh, Elizabeth Catlett. Uh, many of you know about, you know, that the free um, Angela and all political prisoners movement um, involved um, artists from across the country, but also artists internationally. And so Elizabeth Catlett, um, a black radical feminist artist created this series, Angela Libra, and actually used the cell of this series, uh, this series to help support um, Angela's defense campaign. And so now I'm gonna to move to some more contemporary work um, to lead into marking time, um, including a work by Dred Scott, who is one of the artists featured in my, in my book, Marking Time. Um, and you see how his work is citational of earlier freedom struggles. So um, the, the poster from the NAACP, the sign, um, he takes that and he adds by police. A man was lynched by police yesterday. And this was in 2015, hanging outside of um, the Jack Shaman Gallery. Um, and so I use, I, I wanted to show you those works to give you kind of a broader context for, you know, the past couple of centuries of um, a really radical and uh, concerted engagement with um, the visual field, with visual media and art by Black artists and activists um, and thinkers in terms of um, pushing for uh, freedom. Um, in, in, in various causes related to um, Black humanity. Um, and so that inspired me, along with my family's own personal experiences with mass incarceration, to um, start this journey. It's, uh, it's been like 10 years in the making, um, called Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. And the project um, comp is comprised of over 70 interviews with formerly and currently incarcerated artists, um, but also artists who've never been in prison, like for example, the well-known married couple, Keith Calhoun and Chandra McCormick, they're photographers based in New Orleans who have spent uh, the past almost four decades um, photographing the impact of mass incarceration in prisons on the state of Louisiana. And for me in the project, it was really important to have currently incarcerated artists, formerly incarcerated artists, and people who've never been in prison, but who are really committed to the, the issues of um, the hyper-policing and imprisonment of black and brown people in conversation. And I say that because to me, in terms of thinking about uh, Martin Luther King's beloved community and what does a radical practice of love looks like, it is, again, is about expanding our communities and our expanding our sense of like, who's a part of any conversation Often when issues of mass incarceration gets discussed, um, those issues are, um, are framed and discussed by people who are you know, incredible um, allies and, and activists, but they've never been in prison. Um, and so if we're only, if we're talking about an experience that is very specific to 
um, certain populations and certain people and they're only being talked about, then it's again, reproducing um, forms of inequality um, even as we might um, see ourselves as part of um, freedom struggles. And I know Mary has a lot to say about this. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm very eager to be in conversation with her about, about these issues. Um, so I wanna just show you some of the artists, um, the work of some of the artists um, featured in the book and, and the exhibition. Um, and again, like um, it was over the course of these many years of interviewing artists um, and my literally being a student to, um, to these artistic movements that are taking place inside prisons, inside forms of punitive captivity, um, that this project emerged. So for me, it's very much about a collaboration between everyone, uh, me and everyone who was willing to share, including Ronnie Goodman. Um, um, the book opens with um, this self-portrait of Ronnie Goodman um, in the workshop space at San Quentin. He was enrolled in a program um, run by the William James Association. And, you know, and I want to just say, you know, look at this, his self-portrait here and think about the self-portrait of Sojourner Truth um, that, you know, throughout the history of um, Black people being um, in on this continent, it's been self-portrait, self-representation has been not only aesthetic and deeply spiritual and about one's own humanity, but it's been a political practice of claiming um, also a collective identity and that in itself that itself is um, becomes more heightened when we um, think about the stigma placed on imprisoned people, the category of the pr of the prisoner or the criminal. Um, I talk about these works within like kind of conditions um, that imprisoned people share have shared with me. So I think about like what are the very conditions of making art in punitive captivity? And one that came up um, recurring was like the kind of limited access to space, making art in your prison cell or in workshop space, like the one I showed you by Ronnie Goodman. Um, Tamika Cole, who um, is, was in prison in Alabama for 26 years, talked about it as a psychic space. And, um, and I've heard Mary also talk about imprisonment as a psychic space that she says that it's, it's one is about the body, but it's also about uh, the imprisonment of the mind. And so through the practice of art making, Tamika Cole was able to create what she calls her own dark calm. Um, and this is a, again, a space of creativity and a space of envisioning um, her, her life outside of prison. Uh, a space of envisioning in a way that um, black freedom fighters have always had to envision a world that has yet to come, right? So um, this is part of the practice that was taking place in her art making itself. Another issue that came up um, in interviewing artists uh, like Kenneth Reams, who's currently in prison in the state of Arkansas, is on death row and has been there since the mid 90s. He was um, in prison at the age of 18. Um, is one uh, business of prisons, the business, business of benefiting from punishment, um, the way that um, imprisoned people and their families, their loved ones who support them, are exploited through extractive capitalism that sells, um, for example, junk food back to them at prices much higher than um, outside of prison. Um, he's commenting on that, but he's also commenting on the very limited um, materials available to imprisoned artists. So a lot of imprisoned artists will turn to, um, to trash, to found objects, to or organic matter, um, they're experimenting and improvising in the service of making art. Um, and I see that experimentation and that improvising as also at the, at the core of, 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 of freedom struggles. James Huff is um, an artist featured both in Marking Time and Rendering Justice. And, I, and we're gonna talk about him in, in some detail a little later, um, but I, I wanted to show you these two works that I think are so like, you know, they're composed um, and so exquisitely that I think they're powerful visual works and their messages are also really powerful in terms of thinking about the warehousing of um, Black people, of Black bodies in contemporary prisons and also connecting that type of um, warehousing to a longer history of Black subject uh, subjugation and captivity. So it's the warehousing and 
uh, forced labor of enslaved um, uh, people with also thinking about um, exploitative practices of prison labor. Um, and here's a part, another one in that series called How Big House Products Make Boxer Shorts. And if any of you who are um, tuning in out of Pennsylvania, you might be familiar with the fact that the uh, prison, the um, corporation that runs uh, businesses inside prisons, state prisons in Pennsylvania is called Big House Products. So one way that um, imprisoned artists kind of make these connections between um, the long history of black freedom struggles, of, of captivity, um, of, of, of violence is by connecting quite directly to the history of chattel slavery. Um, and for example, using um, symbols and iconography of earlier periods in contemporary work. Um, Art historian Cheryl Finley has written in detail about um, the icon of the Brooks slave ship um, and how it, you know, was um, emerged in 1787 in England um, and was taken up and um, reproduced by abolitionists to show um, to broader publics the the horrors of um, of slavery. That. Um, icon came to the U.S. Um, and abolitionists in the U.S. also took up uh, the this image, um, and it has continued to circulate in contemporary Black art practices. For example, um, Hank Willis Thomas has done a version of um, of the Brooks slave ship, um, and also contemporary artist Jared Owens, who spent over a decade in prison. Um, he's featured in Marking Time and also in Rendering Justice. What he's done here uh, is made a triptych called Elapsium, where he's overlaid the Brooks slave ship with the blueprint of the prison where he was um, imprisoned um, in New Jersey called Ferriton and lined up the holding cells of both the prison and the slave ship. Um, and this title Elapsium again gets at the continuation of black subjugation um, and captivity making um, links that Mary will um, expand upon when she talks um, in her video triptych about, um, she says, has this brilliant line that I like to quote is that, that it's not a school to prison pipeline, it's a prison to prison pipeline. She argues that when um, enslaved, when Africans were uh, taken from the coast of um, Africa um, and put on a ship that this um, suffice to serve as a prison and it's a prison that black people have been struggling with um, for half a millennium. And here, here um, is a, a still shot of Mary from Ain't I a Woman. I'm gonna let Mary talk more about that project and her other work. Um, what I'm gonna do now is just show you a few installation images from the exhibition at PS1. Um, here are political collages by, uh, again, uh, thinking about black freedom struggles. Um, Ojuri Lutalo, who was um, used to be a member of the Black Panther Party and then joined the Black Liberation Army where, um, when he was arrested and, and sentenced to prison, he was held in solitary confinement for 22 years uh, because of his political beliefs and because of the fear that he would influence uh, the general prison population by educating them on, on Black liberation um, um, ideology. Um, a, another work is by Sable Ely Smith, who's currently teaching um, at Columbia University in the School of Fine Art. Um, and incorporates various media into her work. Um, she's an artist, again, who's not been in prison, but so much of her work is reflective on the fact that her father was sentenced to life in prison when she was a young child. Um, and so she's thinking about, um, you know, the ways that prisons um, the, and the landscape of prison are what um, some scholars call carceral geographies really restructure Black families, Black communities, Black neighborhoods, um, and also the kind of ever presence of policing um, and how prisons and experience of the carceral state is beyond just the built environment. It's parole, it's um, surveillance, it's punitive policing, it's the fines that imp uh, formerly imprisoned people have to pay afterwards. It's uh, political disenfranchisement, right? So that the landscape is much more expensive, expensive and broader than um, a discrete building. 
Um, I'll move a little faster so that Mary, Mary has some time to talk. And um, th this is just an installation shot. I wanna give you a visual of what um, the ex exhibition looks like um, and um, take you to um, a room where you see some of the photographs by Keith Calhoun and Chandra McCormick, the couple I told you about out of New Orleans who, um, who have these powerful series on Angola and other state prisons in Louisiana. And, and also documenting, like for example, Angola, many of uh, you are probably familiar with it. It's the largest maximum security prison in the world. Um, it uh, was built on a former slave plantation um, for centuries. It's, you know, it's, it has operated and functioned as a penal farm. And that's a place where people are punished and forced to labor. Um, one of, I think I have two more images and one is, um, this really amazing conversation between um, James Huff, who, um, whose works are the small works on this wall, and then Russell Craig, who has a large portrait here. Um, they were imprisoned together and became really good friends. James Huff became an um, artistic mentor to Russell Craig. They're both out of prison now and you know, still collaborating in really beautiful ways. Um, artistically and politically, and also very active um, in many causes around um, re-entry and the visibility of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated artists. Um, and then the last room I will show you um, is a, um, a wall that's dedicated to Ronnie Goodman, whose image I showed you early in the presentation. Ronnie Goodman um, uh, passed away in August of, of this year. Um, during the height of the pandemic um, on the streets of San Francisco house person. Um, after serving time in prison, he lived um, on the streets for about a decade and was very active in um, movement to, to create um, safe and affordable housing for unhoused people. Um, and so you see some of his other portraits from, from San Quentin. And I bring that up, I, I bring him up and I wanna end with him before turning over to Mary, because I do think it's really important. It's so critical that we continue to connect um, with Martin Luther King's message that about civil rights and um, anti-poverty movements. Um, I do think that especially um, in this critical moment we're in where um, poverty is on the rise, uh, that it's um, our ethical work to do that, to make those commitments. Um, but it also is, is important for us to see how multiple vulnerabilities um, exist among certain populations so that formerly imprisoned people are more likely to be unhoused, are more likely um, to be um, frontline workers in any kind of ways. Um, and, um, and this is something that Mary and I will discuss more um, in conversation with each other. But what I'm going to do right now is turn it over to Mary, who's going to talk to you through the rendering justice. Um, exhibition and also more about her specific work. So this is um, a, a three steals from her most recent video, The Fall of America. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Fleetwood. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me and creating the space to honor Dr. King's legacy today and um, connecting that to Black art and our fight for collective freedom and actualizing uh, his dream of equality. So as um, Dr. Fleetwood so eloquently stated, uh, Black artists have you know, this long history of using art as a means to articulate Black subjugation, uh, erasure, and unfreedom, uh, as well as documenting resistance and the reclamation of our autonomy, personhood, and you know, reclaiming some joy um, in that process. And uh, as an artist and activist, um, my work, you know, isn't just political, it's personal. Um, and in my experience, it's synonymous to what it means to be Black in America. Um, I don't know how to create without asserting uh, my identity. Um, and, you know, if I left it up to the dominant society and mainstream media, I'd be in trouble and um, not have a way to combat the persistent uh, dehumanization um, that many of us grapple with daily. Um, the constant othering and how it all contributes to you know this continued displacement of Black bodies uh, and the violence that's perpetuated um, you know through these systems. 
um, has all, you know, contributed to what we, you know, we see today in terms of mass incarceration, the school to prison pipeline, um, and the systemic denial of wealth and resources, um, you know, as well as pr police brutality um, and critiquing it in a way um, and that it names it um, being as being one of the number one enforcers and maintainers, you know, of these systems of oppression. Um, and it all takes a toll, but art has always been, you know, the space where we could voice it, um, voice our lived experiences and create a vision uh, for something new and revolutionary, not only for ourselves, um, but our communities that we're a part of and responsible for. So with uh, rendering justice, we had the opportunity as a collective um, to come together and individually contribute to this dream and create works that helps, you know, restore a strong sense of identity and autonomy uh, as it relates to the historical and collective experiences of unfreedom um, within Black bodies and mass incarceration. So uh, when you enter the space, um, you're faced with a very contemporary issue around policing of Black bodies. We have um, a series by James Huff. Um, maybe we can get an image or two up. Um, I'll, stop, I'll stop sharing so that um, okay. the, if you want me to go back to any of my images, let me know, Mary, OK? OK, thank you. Do we have a cue? I'm seeing it. Okay. Let's see. So, um, you know, when you enter the space, um, like I said, you're you're faced with you know some very contemporary issues uh, around the policing of Black bodies um, with the series by James Huff detailing the murder of Ahmaud Arbery uh, last February in um, Georgia by Gregory and Travis McMichael. And I think that this um, particular case is very telling about the ways in which um, law enforcement handles violence perpetrated against black people, especially when we consider that the killers weren't arrested um, until cell phone footage leaked. And you know there was this huge uh, public art cry via social media. Um, and that was nearly two months after uh, he was chased down and murdered in cold blood. Um, and there, I believe there are about five by eight um, snapshots of the encounter. Um, but unfortunately, um, the violent, hostile takeover of the U.S. Capitol um, by white domestic terrorists only, I feel, legitimizes the double standard um, that many in our country um, have always said existed between, you know, blacks and whites when it comes to who is policed uh, and deemed a threat at all times and why and whose lives um, are handled with extreme care value and whose isn't um Mary, which sorry yeah. do you want them to show james's work yeah i was yeah james huff um the installation um that he did uh about ahmaud aubrey um the, the black gentleman who was jogging uh in georgia who was essentially chased down and lynched in broad day um and I think it's also interesting that the, the people that per perpetrated this crime also had ties to law enforcement um, and was pretty much, um, you know, there was a conspiracy to cover up this murder until the, the cell footage um, was leaked. Um, yeah, there we have um, a still of the encounter. Um, so, you know, then as we, we move from James's work, we enter, um, to, to the left is a small room which features uh, my new music um, video um, slash it's an anthology of sorts um, entitled The Fall of America that details um, this historic and collective experience of over policing, um, violent policing of black bodies as well as um, the impacts of COVID-19 um, on black America. Um, with that particular, um, yeah, these are these are the stills of, of James Huff. Can we shift to um, the inst my installation for a second or um, a photo? I think Nicole, you have it queued. Okay. So um, you know, with this particular video, I was very interested um, in um, you know giving a, a counter narrative. Um, I'm very interested in, you know, us as, you know, doing the news ourselves 
And um, in this particular piece, I used existing headlines and news footages, news footage to tell a collective um, story of Black oppression and subjugation in the United States. Um, additionally, you know, the editing and treatment of the images there um, bring up an intergenerational narrative and it's non-linear. So you have multiple stories um, unfolding, but they're all interconnected. Um, I feel like, you know, now, in the, in the age of um, you know social media and having technology and cell phones at your disposable, um, you can essentially um, be in control of um, the narratives that you know we hear and the narratives that you want to tell. Um, so it was my hope that people um, would feel the weight of the images and be moved to action, um, starting you know with their own self revelations and then sharing, critiquing, and debating those finds with others. Uh, but overall, you know. After last week, I think we all can agree that a serious, um, you know, reckoning um, around the American dream and who's able to access it and why um, needs to be had. Um, so I think after we leave the area where my piece is, we go, we move to where Jared Owens, um, his work is featured. And Jared is also an artist that's um, uh, in marking time at MoMA PS1. But Jared, he um, uses penile matter, um, which is like found materials within the prison to create uh, a lot of his works um, while in prison and even post-prison. Um, since uh, his um, release, he's uh, been able to still utilize soil that he removed from ferritin. And um, Nicole speaks to this you know, masterfully in her book, Marking Time, about carceral geography and um, how captivity land dispossession and capital um, became and continues to be a source material uh, for artist production. And Jared has, um, you know, used it in several of his works and, um, you know, said himself that is no better way to articulate this than um, to use the very foundation that the prison itself has set on. So I thought that was um, quite brilliant um, in his work. And then as we move through the space, um, we come up upon Russell Craig's work. And Russell, um, he utilizes portraiture uh, to reassert um, not only his autonomy um, at MoMA PS1, but even in um, the exhibit at the African American Museum, he's using it to give to help others, um, you know, obtain a voice. Um, unfortunately, the series um, that's at African American uh, Museum in Philadelphia, um, those victims are all deceased. Um, and have been, you know, the victim of victims of uh, police brutality. Um, when we look at George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, so I think that's um, just a brilliant critique. Um, and then we move on to Philadelphia's own uh, Deb Willis. I believe her work is next at the exhibit. And Michelle Jones, um, they collabed on this. A uh, piece called The Point of Triangulation. Um, they utilize photography to interrogate um, the conscious and unconscious bias of viewers. Um, the work includes uh, the photographs of formerly incarcerated artists, um, a few of which it's Stan uh, Stanley Morgan, uh, one of my colleagues and good friends. Um, one of uh, a lot of, well, a few of the, the um, the, the portrait subjects are people that I know personally and have worked with um, around activism as far as prison reform and land justice in the city. Um, we also have, yes. So after um, point of triangulation, I believe we move over to Titus Kapar and Dwayne Betts. And this is a, a project that, a, a, another um, iteration of a project that they've done before um, that utilizes um, the photos um, of people who have been in contact with the justice system. And, um, but in this, and before he used arrest records um, to tell a different story by redacting some of the, the, um, the narrative. But in this one, um, the figures are from Mural Arts' Guild program. And he use, um, they're utilizing the Declaration of Independence um, to tell a story um, of unfreedom and, and the um, struggle to gain that um, autonomy over their lives. 
Uh, so I believe that's about it for the exhibit. Mary, that's great. And like, as you were going through it and I, and, and I was thinking about some of the things that were coming up earlier for and when I was presenting, I immediately thought about the work of Ida B. Wells and anti-lynching campaigns and use and what the NAACP did in terms of like taking control over media, you know, claiming access to journalism and to um, documenting what's happening in black communities and to black people, like issues that were not be, being reported like lynchings, right? Right. Um, and you mentioned that in your The Fall of America. And so I was just thinking about um, the importance of who's telling the story, visually and through text, who's telling the stories. Um, and I just wondered if you have more to say about that. Yeah, um, for me, I feel like it's um, extremely important um, because, you know, with a lot of times with mainstream media, um, there seems to be, you know, um, a lot of shock around racism and police brutality that it still exists in the country. So in my mind, um, counter narratives are extremely um, important to come to combat that dissonance um, or arbitrary ignorance that a lot of us seem to wrestle with especially when we um, consider the ways in which mainstream media reports the news. A lot of times the stories are conveyed as isolated incidents um, and they don't necessarily delve into the historical frameworks that connect these incidents of racial violence and oppression to larger conversations about racism and white supremacy. Um, you know, all of the, and all of the mechanisms um, in which they're, they're being enforced, upheld and perpetuated in our society and culture. So I wanted to create something that was holistic and told a, a more fuller story about the collective trauma that Black people, um, you know, being essentially denied this American dream, um, which is that, you know, all people are created equal and entitled to, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So for me, the fall of America has to happen if we want to live up to everything that we purport that this country um, represents. Well, I'm wondering if while we're chatting, if um, someone in the museum might be able to pull up, queue up just even a portion of it, if we could share part of Fall of America. And I, the reason I say that is because I just feel like it's even more resonant to this conversation given January 6th. Right. Um, you know, and given like, um, if you think about um, one of the ways that the state legitimates the hyper incarceration of black people is through this representation of like criminalization criminals right um of of being a public threat right um and the kind of violence that was like just broadcasted on january 6 like in the middle of the afternoon um on the you know that on the nation state um yeah. it's it is um it's a white imaginings of what black people do, but it's actually white people who are doing this, right? It's white people who are the biggest threat to governance, to democracy, <laughs> to right. ideas about equality. Um, and I just wanted to, and I feel like your video is getting at that too. Right, right. Um, so it's a projection of their of their behavior into black bodies. Right, and and also we see that the police know how to you know operate with extreme caution and care. Um, you know these people were armed. Um, they created dozens, I don't know, thousands of felonies. Um, and at the end of the night, they arrested like 60, 70 people. Um, we know that if that had been a BLM protest or black people, they wouldn't have made it to those steps. Um, you know, we had an instance of a woman who had made a U-turn um, and was assassinated in her car with her 13 month old in the back seat. And she hadn't even reached the point, yeah. So, so can we watch a clip of this? Are you, um, I think it'd be great to share with people. Can we get audio?
Babylon, televised murder marathons, African Amazon, wrestling in the Amazon, Marine Maritime, watch the seven seas align when I conjure rhyme. Why you waiting on a sign, lost in the paradigm, I carry the cross, be hell, lapel, horseman, never shut my physical shell on that 33rd parallel, we paraphrase the ghetto as hell, theories on government filled with conspiracy tales, paranoid in the slums cause most our leaders have failed, politicians play dumb and speak with forked tongue, parasitic traits of snakes, feet in us little crumbs. But wait, I ain't get the random, a random, a random shootouts with the cops, and I fade away like and one. My bullets throwing tantrums till you fall off from my handgun. It's the final call, send a band drum. It's the fall of America, man, I'm in the stereo. Wake up in the air, martial law in your area. King of Rex, Pendle. Scripts prophesize the apocalypse. Global warning, warming ice caps, polar shifts. No running water, gas, food, electric. The dark side of the moon, seven whole day eclipse. Ages with binoculars, police state, metropolis. Freedom fighters, organizers, rally up the populace. Against the brainwashing techniques of microchips, the monetary system no longer determines opulence. Capitalism driven, generational recidivism. Illuminati chants as we overthrow the system. Can't turn the clocks back on the times that we live in to the powers back in the hands of the citizens. Executive orders, election supporters, protect the conformists, neglect the assures, news quarters. Recorded reporters, stress empty rhetoric. Ignore it, retorted, express the importance. The stress and the torment, the rest without warmers. The justice is foreign, the customs ignoring, discuss the orient. It's the fall of America, man, I'm in a stereo. Wake up in the air, martial law in your area. King of Rex, plan no barbarism. I mean, it's just watching that now. So tell us when you made that, because it's almost as if you, you know, that this was about January 6th. I mean, it's you're bringing up all the issues that come, are crystallized very much in with January 6th, the like voter suppression, um, white nativism, white settler violence, literally, you know, um, fas <laughs> white fascism. Right, right. I think it's a story that's been writing itself my whole life. Um, I don't think there's a time that I wasn't writing it. Um, but as far as like the images, the images I, were, I was pulling up until the day that I had to, you know, hand it into the museum. So you do see Walter Wallace um, featured um, in that video in a confrontation that a lot of the young people um, and residents of Westville, well, all over Philadelphia had. Before you finished, right? If I recall, right. So you were making this up until October to yeah. end up, right? So right. It was, I remember it was like, cause you were actually protesting and finishing the video at the same time, which I think is like, it's at the core of what this talk is about. Right, yeah. Um, it was definitely, I mean, it is happening always in real time, um, especially for uh, black people. I have a couple more questions for you, and then, then I think we can open it to the audience. Okay. Okay. So I talked about for people haven't seen everyone hasn't seen um, "Ain't I a Woman," and I've brought up Sojourner Truth, and I wanted you to just talk a bit about first tell them what the video is about. Um, if you want, I can post the YouTube link in the chat, but I think okay. it's 
important for you to talk about it and also like how you're connecting to a longer history of black freedom struggles and black feminist and black abolitionist work? Right. Um, you know, for me, um, and our woman is such a, a sensitive and deeply, you know, personal journal journey for me. Um, and it had to be told uh, for me, you know, in a very intimate way. So, um, you know, before it's released, if you Google my name, uh, you'd find stories around, you know, being housing insecure, you know, a college student, um, you know, an uh, inquiry did an article, homeless convict, now she's a award winner. So, um, and trying to tell a multi-dimensional story that could speak to my experiences before, during, and after incarceration was tough, um, but necessary in re reintroducing myself to the public and helping um, viewers feel comfortable enough to connect uh, with the totality of my story. Um, I wanted the viewer to know what it was like to grow up in North Philadelphia. Um, so we shot at a notorious um, housing project um, around the corner from where I grew up. Um, from um, Johnson Homes. Um, I wanted the birthing scene um, to be as visceral and um, as close as to what I, you know, um, actually experienced. So we shot it at Eastern State Penitentiary in there. Um, Can I just interrupt to say for people who don't know, I mean, part, at the core of it is you documenting your 43 hour labor in prison while you're shackled. Right, right. Um, and, and then also, you know, post labor being placed in solitary confinement, um, administrative segregation, um, which is a form of solitary confinement for my own protection. Um, since I had endured a major surgery and had about 20 staples across um, the, 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 my midsection. Um, so, um, you know, you know, as with the fall of America, um, you know, I spoke to an array of you know, experiences with policing and historical bouts with systemic oppression in this country. Um, I wanted a much fuller and expansive story um, about myself and Ain't I a Woman is, is pretty much, um, you know, that. Um, and, you know, when I think about Sojourner Truth um, as a mother and as someone who used, um, you know, visual imagery um, to share that truth and reclaim her dignity in her liberatory work, um, it was, you know, actually something that really inspired me to, you know, title my work um, behind her famous speech and, you know, her critiquing the lack of inclusive inclusivity in white feminism and the disregard to acknowledge um, black women. Um, so when I, I think of her, you know, as a mother, you know, as this powerful figure, I think it was very critical for me to look you know, towards the foremothers, towards the past, and trying to understand my present, you know, circumstance as a Black woman in America. Um, I also, you know, felt it was necessary and integral, um, you know, part of being able to move forward with, you know, practical um, solutions, um, a sort of, you know, a blueprint, you know, drawing on those oracle traditions and ways in which we, you know, historically have passed down knowledge and wisdom um, for freedom. So, you know, as Black people, she was definitely a part of my shadow work. Um, and it's, you know, it's something that I continue to draw from. Um, so, yeah, studying pioneers like Angela Davis, Asada Shakur, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou, um, you know, Zora Neale Hurston, even, you know, some of the contemporaries, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, you, um, Lauren Hill, all of that has contributed um, to my art and practice and how it evolves. You know, and I love how um, in one you know, podcast interview with you for Louder Than a Riot, you're talking about like how ISIS the Savior came up. And I just bring that up because I think at the core of um, this kind of work collectively and also individually is a, a radical self-making because so much of like the narrative we've inherited, right? Right. About black people um, on this land is uh, you know, is, is a, a refutal of our, refusal of our very own humanity and our like family structures and everything we love and we hold dear to us. I mean, part of what became very apparent for me working on the book um, is that that's the history of our bodies here on this continent is one where we're taken away from everyone and everything we love. Right, and prisons are a, a, a kind of current manifestation of that. 
And your ain't I a woman is such a radical refusal of being separated from your loved one, um, from your child. Right. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I really just, um, I mean, that's another work that felt like I was actually writing it like my whole life up until the moment that it was um, filmed. Um, you know, every day you're confronted with, you know, these narratives that don't represent, you know, our whole truth or look at us as whole beings. Um, and, um, you know, art is just has has been, you know, the only, you know, medium I've had at my access, um, you know, to really, you um, you know, position myself and to humanize myself in a way that, um, you know, others can connect with it, but I also could help, you know, process some of that trauma and find meaning and um, use it to empower myself and, you know, connect it with other, you know, women um, who share the same experience and, you know, hopefully, you know, help them gain some empowerment as well. So uh, I do have some questions coming up for you and I can, people were asking about Ain't I Woman. I can try to show a clip, but I think when I've done it before on Zoom that people couldn't hear. So Mary, pl please let me know if you can hear it. Okay, I'm gonna just okay. show, show the like beginning of it if I can. Sure. Um, but let me know if you can hear. Is there any sound? Yeah. So I'll just show a couple of minutes. Now I'm pregnant, stressing, can find behind the bars and riverside corrections. Shackled as we made an exit, greeted by the paramedics. Left leg cuffed to the bed during the C section. Anesthesiologist apprehensive and fretting. A med student leaves the room, quickly changes direction. Claims it's too upset in her slaps. She doesn't want to risk infection. 43 hours on labor is life threatening. The flashback screams echo from a slave ship. Wreckage, a hard lesson. But tell me what's the deeper message? Faced with the same evils. Does this the re really repeat itself, or is it the people? Instead of answering the door, I should have peeked from the peephole. Slid off the side door to slip on some street clothes. No visit doesn't amount from any of my amigos. I live in hell and they cold sweats and dizzy spells, though. Guess what? Nah, they never saw a love like this. Infirmary stretched out on the gurney. Just fire my attorney. Judge trying to burn me. Cold D just OD. So the A want to turn me. But I live by the cold that the OGs learn me. Waiting on the day that I'm free. The reason ain't my seat. Got the prescribed post part of medicine. 40 milligrams of lithium, 30 thorazine. Plus a couple sedatives to help me cope with these dreams. Dwelling on the negatives. Can't call on my relatives. So I eat, sleep, shit. Where the peace belly is? Should've used the delegates. But what is the purpose? Six years on the run before my background surface luckily how was out of town on a purchase connect okay so mary i'm just gonna um fast forward towards the end just so uh, where you're making some uh, bigger, bigger connections okay
because uh, questions are popping up and I want to make sure we have time. Um, you're so powerful, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so can I ask you, I, I told you it's supposed to be more conversation, but people have lots of questions for you. So can I, do you mind if I ask them? Sure. Okay. So um, someone is asking about the next step in your career. Um, well, the next step is, is basically a continuation of this work. Um, last spring, I had the opportunity to um, facilitate some creative writing workshops at Riverside Corrections, which is the women's facility where I was housed, where I went into labor and eventually, um, you know, had that hor horrific experience. Um, so I was able to go back there and conduct this creative writing workshop um, along with a guest facilitator, Nina Ball um, Lyrispec, which is a phenomenal poet from our city, um, originally from Baltimore, but Nina's um, been in Philly for like almost two decades now. But um, yeah, it's usually um, using, you know, basically the blueprint that I've been able to, you know, establish as far as like using my own personal story to um, inform policy, to co-author legislation, and um, you know, to give those tools um, and share those tools um, with women that are um, currently incarcerated, um, and you know, helping them to realize the power in their own story and redefining um, their story, um, and also you know, continuing to help um, you know mothers um, who are you know coming home and struggling with reentry. Um, I do a lot of work with the Dignity Act Now Collective, um, who um, during the pandemic was very instrumental in um, helping assist with community bailout and the national bailout with, um, you know, helping women re-enter into the community, um, you know, getting them laptops so they stay digitally connected and also, you know, helping out with other supportive services. Um, so that's pretty much what the work looks like now, but also I'll be returning back, um, which is not Riverside anymore. They've moved the men into that facility and the women have moved into ASD and um, Mod 3, which are like trailers, um, which um, the reports we're getting are very, um, you know, horrific place to be. There's mold um, and then a lot of them are still sheltering in place, which essentially means um, a lot of the women are solitary confined. So I'm working with Mural Arts right now to um, uh, collaborate on a mural with the women and we'll send the kits in and they'll paint them um, within their cell and then mail them back out and then we'll do an installation um, in the city, a public art um, piece um, around uh, sisterhood, womanhood, motherhood. That's beautiful. Um, Mary, what, I mean, this, you've mentioned to me before about going back to do art workshop and like, what, what, what is it? What was it like for you to go back to like this, like space of your trauma? I mean, like, <laughs> what was, how, what was your, like, how did you prepare yourself for that? And was it different than what you thought it was gonna, I mean, I just want you to talk a bit about it. Right, well, at the time, um, you know, I discussed it, um, cause at the time I was in therapy, so I had discussed it with my therapist um, about, you know, all the potential harms that it could cause, but then also, um, you know, figuring out ways that it could be cathartic and very empowering for me to come back in this capacity versus um, when I had no autonomy and, um, you know, just was dehumanized on, you know, every level. So I like what, really, you, what you said is important because often when we're doing this work for a community, we often, we, we have trauma that can get re-triggered by our own experiences with police brutality or, you know, the very things that we're fighting against. We, many of us are carrying in our bodies, the experiences of, of being traumatized and harmed. Right. I mean, it, it was hard. It was difficult. But I think for me, the number one motivating force was, um, you know, sharing my experiences and giving the women there some hope 
you know, trying to be what I didn't have when I was incarcerated. So I think that kind of overpowered, you know, my fear. And I mean, honestly, I hadn't dealt with the trauma of my incarceration until I began making the film Ain't I a Woman. Um, so I had an opportunity to process and go through a lot of the motions. Cause I mean, in the beginning of the trip that you can see, I'm reenacting the labor process. I'm reenacting, you know, being handcuffed, um, you know, being um, shackled to the bed, the gurney. Um, so Mary, there's some, I'm going to just add, read some of the questions. Um, uh, one is a, like kind of, I think an easy question. Uh, how can people follow you on Instagram? Oh yeah. Um, I'm on Instagram under my artist name, which is Isis the Savior. I-S-I-S-T-H-A-S-A-V-I-O-U-R. Um, I'm on Facebook is, I have an artist page, Isis the Savior, but then I have a personal page where you can connect with me, which is my full name, uh, Mary Enoch Elizabeth Baxter. I think it's listed somewhere around here. Um, but yeah, that's how you can connect with me. Or you can go to my YouTube, which is youtube.com backslash Isis Revisited um, for more. Um, you also can just Google um, the latest uh, interview I had with NPR for Louder Than a Riot, which is um, an article and an hour long podcast um, that amazing details like a lot of my journey. I wouldn't say all of my journey. Um, because we would need like a whole season, but <laughs> um, yeah. And with all of that, uh, you know, these, especially thinking about these different platforms, someone asked, do you think about audience? So, well, there's a question for you actually about platform and media. Like how do you choose your platform? Because you're a spoken word artist, you're a video artist, you write, you're an activist, you've done some poster campaigns, right? So- Yeah, I have a few murals in the city right now. Um, so there are questions about, your medium and platform and then also questions about do you are you thinking about the audience as you're creating those works um i am thinking about my audience um first and foremost you know i make my art for myself um so that's like i'm my hugest fan and biggest critic um and then um i'm making you know my art for my community and to give a voice to people that you know don't have the luxury of you know sharing their experiences um, then another question, do you think that your intent sharing the trauma that keeps occurring in the black community will make a long lasting effect? Could it lead to changing the psyche of some of your, um, the patrons? I think the audience is what is meant by patrons. I think so. Um, you know, with Ain't Our Woman, it has been used, you know, as a, um, engagement, you know, um, tool, uh, for community members, you know, to get involved in, you know, co-governance. Um, I've also had the opportunity to co-author legislation. Um, so I think that, you know, my art has opened doors for me. I mean, the, the last part of the triptych, which, um, you know, that was an actual press conference that we had with Larry Krasner, Mayor Kenny, and some other folks in local government. Um, so, I mean, it's, um, it's really, you know, been able to, you know, get me access to spaces that I, I wouldn't necessarily have been. Um, and also it, it, in my opinion, has given me a voice. Um, so um, I think that it is um, creating change, not only within my own personal transformation, but also in the lives of other women that have been impacted by incarceration. Mary, there's another question about Louder Than a Riot. Just asking if you could talk about that podcast and how you got involved. So, um, <laughs> are there other pod, which is a great story in and of itself. And then are there other podcasts that cover similar material? Yeah, we did one with, um, I did one with Dr. Fleetwood, um, with MoMA PS1. What was the name of our effort? It's the, it's the MoMA Magazine podcast and we focused um, on abolition. So it's like four different artists giving their different like kind of engagement with the idea of abolition and it's all and they all kind of differently impacted by the carceral state also so it's it's a really kind of nuanced discussion it, yeah, so it's that, a MoMA magazine podcast yeah so that's um you know uh, one uh, another podcast but as far as the um the louder than a riot podcast kind of happened unexpectedly um I, i'll try to be brief with the story but about less than two years ago i i did um a um, one of those ancestry 23andme kits um and 
I was working on the Afrofuturism project, but based on my actual DNA, but um, through that process, I was able to locate my birth father and some siblings. And my sister just happened to be an award-winning um, podcast producer that worked at NPR Loud in the Riot. And she was able to really, um, you know, produce and interview me um, and create a very nuanced, holistic story that didn't um, revolve around solely on my trauma. Um, so that's pretty much a fast forward uh, explanation about that. <laughs> so two more questions. One is um, one that came up earlier and I'm just seeing it now about some of the challenges of curating. And, uh, and then there's a question for you, uh, Mary, that I, that's a really important question. Okay. Uh, um, so around the exhibition and curating, you know, it, for me, the, uh, curating has, it's been like an enormous gift because I'm an academic and I mainly work with research and text. Um, but when you, um, put something on the walls of the museum or the floor of the museum or just engage audiences like that, it, it really transforms the material itself and how people engage it. And it be, for me, it was much more collaborative. I loved how like exhibitions are like, I think by their very nature, they have, they're collaborative, you know, and they're all about audience engagement. So for, for me, it's been like incredibly rewarding to have people who can't get to the exhibition because they're my, one of my targeted audiences are incarcerated people. They can't get to PS1. We have sent them visuals from the exhibition, but having the book circulate in prison and um, we made a commitment to have the book uh, also printed in paper uh, back and sent to imprison people for free. And so like that, having the book and exhibition and conversation and reaching different audiences have been really meaningful. Um, Mary, so the questions that for you are like, they're combined questions and they get at a point that you were making earlier. We are talking about black freedom struggles and visions of freedom. And, um, and you brought up joy earlier and not letting people take your joy. Um, and so someone, uh, one question is, do you feel that the expectation for to be resilient and strong has been re-traumatizing for you? Has it served in your opinion to ex um, excuse trauma? And then connected to that is another question that came in immediately afterwards. How do you reclaim joy? And I, th I, and I, I think we can end um, on, on this, like, like this is at the core of the work we're doing, right? It's like, you, um, right. about envisioning freedom and connecting with joy. Yeah. I mean, so for me, um, I would never excuse, excuse the trauma. Um, that's something that, you know, I probably deal with for the rest of my life. Um, but definitely, um, not letting it, um, dictate, you know, the ways in which that, you know, I'm, I'm, the ways in which that I move forward in my life, like not letting it, um, you know, stop me from pursuing my goals, um, you know, using it as motivation, because I mean, you either can use it as something that's going to get you down or use it to something that's going, for something that's going to uplift you. And I think that's the, the alchemy of what, you know, Black artists are able to do, you know, we're able to transform something that was meant to kill us um into something that can reinvent and reinvigorate and also you know get others excited about this fight for freedom um and the second part of the question was oh uh, how do i reclaim black joy um well i, I also um have uh, been working on um a mural series um right now i have a triptych um uh Start Loving Black People, that's at 27th and Allegheny. Um, I have funding to do five more, so you'll see them pop up in the city. They're five by 15 feet. So, um, you know, that's another way that, um, you know, I reclaim joy um, in my art and in, you know, in my everyday um, living um, is to not only, you know, demand it, you know, from myself, uh, because a lot of us have internalized the hatred, but also demand it from anybody that I come encounter, you know, in contact with. Well, and I've seen some joy. I mean, that sounds in some ways that's like it's beautiful, and it sounds in some ways very lofty. But I have, can you talk about battle rapping with your son? Because <laughs> that seems really yeah. So <laughs> my son. <laughs> so you know, being a single mom, my son pretty much travels with me um, essentially, you know, everywhere that I go. So he's been in the studio 
you know, since he was, you know, like three or four, um, I've always taken him to the studio and then later on, you know, creating a space in my house for us to record um, and to do, you know, reference tracks. So um, yeah, and you'll see it in the podcast. It's like towards the end, my sister um, documents one of our, our uh, battle sessions. So yeah, battle rap um, has been a way, um, you know, to engage my son and, you know, include him in my art and also encourage him to do art and express himself without limits. Um, so that's definitely a way that um, we reclaim joy um, in my household. So um, I want to just thank everyone for turning out. Mary, thank you so much for being in dialogue with me. Oh, thanks and, for having me. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Mary. Did you want to say any last comments before I turn it back over to the museum uh, to close us out? No, not really. Just thanks for having me. Um, I, it's always a joy to be with Dr. Fleetwood and for her to um, articulate, you know, the work the way that she does. Um, yeah, just so inspiring. So I'm just happy to be here. And thanks to the African American Museum for um, allowing me to come, uh, you know, sharing this conversation. Mary, thank you so much and happy and peaceful MLK Day. And, you know, figure out your role in serving, especially the community you're in. Yeah. Dr. Fleetwood, thank you so much for joining us and being with us. Mary, it's been so great to have you return. Uh, we'd like to thank our audiences for spending time with us and celebrating the life and legacy of MLK, Dr. Martin Luther King, over the course of the last three, day, three days. Uh, we've had great, uh, enriching conversations. We've heard beautiful poetry. We've seen wonderful art. Um, most of all, we are so excited that uh, we have deeply reflected on this year's theme of what can we do for others. So we leave you with that. Enjoy the rest of your Monday, stay safe, and please uh, stay in contact with the African American Museum in Philadelphia, our partners at Mural Arts Philadelphia, and certainly these uh, incredible scholars and artists that are with us tonight. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>